Thank you for being with us today and welcome. Uh, my name is Tara Mann. Following our core values of faith, hope, love, and generosity, Dr. Tony has over the past 30 years used his seven key principles of cancer therapy to bring integrative healing solutions to thousands of cancer patients from around the world at our two medical destinations in Tijuana and Cancun, Mexico. His healing philosophy is beautifully captured in his recently published book, Hope for Cancer, Seven Principles to Remove Fear and Empower Your Healing Journey. If you don't have Dr. Tony's book already, it's a must have, packed with information in a way you can understand and apply to your life regardless of your health status. Now on Kindle, and the new hardcover is coming up this month. We are super excited to announce that the Hope for Cancer Seven Principles to Remove Fear and Empower Your Healing Journey is on the Amazon bestseller list in its category at number 11. So a big congrats to Dr. Tony and all the Hope for Cancer team for this exciting achievement. So with that, let's get started. I know we're all excited about a great topic, one of my favorites. Um, so just so that you know, please enter your questions in the chat throughout the presentation. You don't necessarily have to wait till the end. Afterwards, we do have a special patient guest, Corey, joining us. And followed by that, uh, after that will be the Q&A session. Today, Dr. Tony is sharing his vast knowledge in the area of all things detoxification and, and cancer. This is the first part of a two-part series. Part two will air in two weeks on October 15th. So a big welcome and thank you to you, Dr. Tony. Thank you so much, Tara. Thank you very much and um, great job. I want to thank the team behind the scenes to make this possible. Um, it's uh, couldn't do it without them. And more importantly, all of you that are here uh, once again, some of you for the first time, I was pleased to see uh, you know, attendees from all over the US and many parts of the world. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Corey, also for being uh, today's patient guest. We're going to uh, be talking about a very, very important topic, one that is a key principle in the seven key principles to cancer therapy. Uh, one of my dear colleagues says that uh, Dr. Klinhardt, Dietrich Klinhardt out of Germany, some of you may have heard his name, and he says, we should live a life of detoxification. And in any cancer therapy, uh, we need to detox extensively so that the byproducts of cell metabolism, the byproducts or the residue of killing these cancer cells and pathogens, whether they're bacteria, parasites, or fungi, so that they could leave the body. So as soon as I could share my screen, uh, we can start my presentation, Tara. Uh, so I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, there you go. So now I could do that. And uh, that's not it. Let me get to my screen here. So here we are. Uh, today's webinar is a two part uh, series, as Tara said. Part one, we'll talk about direct and indirect causes of cancer. Because, you know, when we treat cancer by giving a, a substance, a drug, uh, radiation, or any therapy, we're not necessarily treating the causes of cancer. So uh, toxicity is a direct and indirect cause of toxin and cancer, I should say. And it is definitely associated with the development and the progression of malignancy and the metastasis. Also, we'll look at the toxicity of chemotherapy and radiation. Oftentimes we hear this, right? That chemo and radiation are toxic to our cells, but let's understand why that is so. And then we'll unlock uh, and unblock uh, some of the detox pathways, you know, so for us to understand that every single part of your day, whether it's smiling, laughing, breathing, 
going to the restroom, uh, what you're eating, really a lot of this has to do with detoxification. And then we'll look at the at detoxification at the cell level. The problems with heavy metals uh, is, is, is quite a, a big deal in health and disease. And that will be part one. So the interesting thing is that part one is a lot of education, a lot of information. However, it's so important because once you know this, then when we talk about part two, and look at how to detox, which will happen on October 15th, we know the fundamental principles of why it is very important. And in addition to that, when you're doing a detox uh, routine, let's say you're doing a coffee enema, so you understand the pathways and you're not mentally blocked of, you know, when you're going to do a coffee enema for the first time, uh, for example. So, we know that we are living uh, in a world that is increasingly uh, toxic. It's just the nature of what's happening. Uh, you know, if we look at this planet 10, 20, 15 years ago, it's, it's vastly different than it is today, unfortunately. And this toxicity segues into cancer, Unwellness, if that's a word I could use, unwellness. So it's not only cancer, it's any chronic disease. It's uh, including psychological and emotional challenges have to do with toxicity. So this is a vast topic that really is implied in, in our lives on a daily basis and how we're going to live the rest of the uh, years that the Lord has given us, right? Are we going to live in health and then die from natural causes? Or are we going to suffer and ultimately die of chronic disease, right? I think it's very clear that we want to live a healthy, great quality of life. So as you see here, and it was the first topic on my outline, direct and indirect causes of cancer. There's a vast number of uh, causes of cancer Let's take them in segments here. So first we will see the sources of toxins that are called exotoxins. Exo means from the outside. So these are toxins that come to us from our environment. These are uh, pharmaceutical drugs, environmental toxins like uh, 5G radiation, pollution, contamination of water and food supplies, smoking and alcohol and as I mentioned, radiation and electromagnetic field. These are the main sources of exotoxins. Then we look at the category of endotoxin, those toxins that are from within. And we see here obesity, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is like the rusting, right? The rusting that happens in our body uh, one could say naturally, as cells age and as people become more sedentary, that's another source of endotoxins. We have a weakened immune system, poor diet, metabolic and bacterial byproducts, and nutritional deficiency. This is so, so important because we cannot be in ideal health or recover from cancer with nutritional deficiencies. Our cells need nutrients to heal and to be healthy. And one of them is water, right? The vitamins, the minerals, amino acids, uh, the proteins. And so when we have these endotoxins, ultimately we're in that situation called oxidative stress. And that creates a whole cascade that leads to disease and we'll see that. Uh, shortly. And then the other source of toxins are what we call mental and spiritual toxins. And this is stress, anxiety, depression, and sleep deprivation. It's unfortunate now in 2021 with this uh, crisis that we've been living for nearly two years that the level of stress, anxiety, and depression has skyrocketed, as has the number of suicides 
domestic abuse and so forth. So now is the time where we really have to detox these mental, mental and, and spiritual uh, and emotional toxins. And then the last category here are toxins, um, like how do the genes, the genes that we inherit contribute to cancer? And maybe indirectly, we could say that this is a, a toxin, right? But remember, this is the least of the toxin because only five to 10%. And that's really being um, a, a little bit of an exaggeration. I believe this number is like at most 5% of all cancers are genetic in origin. And so, however, even those 5%, we could turn those epigenetic switches off. It's like when you go into a room and yes, you know, the, you know where the light switch is and you could turn the light on or not turn it on. So these, even these genetic inherited um, uh, defects can be state, can, can, we can do things to make sure they, they're not turned on. And that's epigenetics. That's what we're going to learn throughout this uh, presentation. So the category of toxins and cancer. This was a work from a, a field of uh, science and medicine and research called uh, homotoxicology. And this is the normal pathway of how the body eliminates toxins in, our, in, in the cells. And ultimately, if it doesn't, it leads to number six, which is cancer neoplasm. So this chart is actually in my book, in my first book, Hope for Cancer, Seven Principles to Remove Fear and Empower Your Healing Journey. So we have first that when a toxin is absorbed into our, our body, we have mechanisms to excrete this toxin uh, by sweating, urine, bile, and many other uh, ways that we eliminate. If that doesn't happen in an ideal fashion, then the body begins to try to ward off these toxins by creating an inflammatory response. Remember, inflammation is necessary for healing. So when there's inflammation, it's not that the body is turning against us, it's that the body is trying to survive. The cells, the tissue, the organ is, are trying to survive. However, when these toxins come in, it poses a great challenge to our, our cells and the body responds with, a, with maybe a, a, a too strong of an inflammatory response. And then we have things like all the itises, right? Arthritis, nephritis, hepatitis, uh, chondritis, osteoarthritis, and so forth, and, and things like eczema as well. And so then these toxins uh, go into the stage three, which is that they're deposited and they're stored in what's called the extracellular matrix. That's a space around the cells, the matrix. Some uh, books call that the ground regulating system, right? Because there's a lot to be said about what happens in that matrix in that ground regulating system. And so it's deposited, it's stored there, and then this creates uh, an entrenched impregnation of these toxins, and then it begins to cause damage to certain enzymes, metabolic processes, and normal functioning of the cells that leads to degeneration. And already, you know, this is in red when we have degeneration. You see there's red, there's yellow, and there's green, right? So one and two, uh, you know, we could really quickly restore health. Three and four, where it's yellow, it's like the yellow light, right? Things are coming closer to that red light. So we have to be a little more intense with our therapies. And then when there's the red light, uh, degeneration and ultimately neoplasm or cancer, then we really have to do robust, um, you know, consistent detoxification routines. And uh, to switch to the next slide, let's go uh, a little bit about how does cancer form, 
how does it progress and what how does metastasis happen and how do toxins intervene in this process so there you have a healthy cell the healthy cells uh you know become uh damage they become inflamed they are toxins and then we have uh tumor uh initiation and this is the the process that's been studied and documented of oncogenesis or cancer cell formation so we have the initial tumor from from the healthy cells to the tumor initiation this can take many years, right? The, 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 the cancer cells are there and then we have the tumor formation. This can take 15 to 20 years. I believe that based on what's happening in society now, the planet be more contaminated, that this can be five to 10 years that cancer can develop as opposed to a number of years ago where it could be 15 to 20 years. So. Then there's tumor progression, and the tumor progression, you know, now the cells are uh, wanting to metastasize, and they invade the bloodstream. That's what you see there in red. That's the bloodstream, and the cancer stem cells, or the circulating tumor cells, leave the primary tumor. They go into the bloodstream, and now they can metastasize. And I did a webinar where I explained this process in detail, uh, but just as a reminder, the primary tumor has basically two types of cells. Uh, they're cancer stem cells and non-cancer stem cells. The non-cancer stem cells make up about 99% of those cells. They cannot metastasize. Those are the that can be killed by chemotherapy and or radiation. But the 1% called the cancer stem cells are the ones that we're seeing here that leave the primary tumor, go into the bloodstream, and ultimately metastasize somewhere. And these are the cells that chemotherapy and radiation cannot destroy. This is why maybe some of you have been told you're in remission, or you know someone, and then sometime later, six months, a year, two years, three years, the cancer came back. Or it's not that it came back, it's that these cells, the circulating tumor cells, or the cancer stem cells were not destroyed. And because they're only 1%, they're few in number, then when they aggregate again and increase their number, then that's when we hear the words relapse or recurrence or the cancer came back. But in reality, cancer cells were there all the time. And so basically, you know, the concept is here from the seed to the soil. All this is important to uh, prevent this process from happening in us who haven't been diagnosed with cancer and to reverse this process and those of you that are challenged with cancer at the moment. And so here we look at the key characteristics of toxins that can lead to the formation of cancer. And that's cancers that affect the genome, the genes, that's genotoxin. And uh, then we have uh, uh, toxins that induce epigenetic changes right? And for example, uh, methylation pathways, and we'll talk about that later. And then there's uh, toxins that induce chronic inflammation by increasing oxidative stress. So all these, there are many, many characteristics of uh, the toxins process that can lead to cancer. Can, uh, toxins, for example, can suppress the immune system. It can alter the DNA's ability to repair. It uh, modulates the signaling pathways in, in the cell. See, we're information pathways. The cells are communicating with each other on a second by second or millisecond by millisecond uh, nature. So anything that affects that signaling molecules or that signaling 
energetic electrical information is going to lead to disease. Um, cancer cells become immortal once they're in a toxic uh, environment. And toxins alter also cell proliferation, cell death, and the nutrient supply of, of cells. So a lot going on with toxins that ultimately nudge healthy cells to acquire those characteristics that are necessary for cancer to form and cancer to metastasize. So by eliminating toxins, this is a, good, a very important slide because it shows us that by eliminating toxins and by decreasing the exposure to toxins that we talked about before, remember? The indirect, the direct, the exotoxins, the endotoxins, the emotional spiritual toxins, then by knowing all this, we could significantly decrease our risk of having cancer progression, cancer metastasis, and formation of cancer. We know that cancer is becoming more and more uh, prominent now. The incidence of cancer is increasing year by year, and definitely toxins play a part in that. So isn't it nice to know this because now you're empowered and you could be proactive in doing detox methods that we'll talk about in part two that can uh, really literally save our lives. And this was actually published in 2020 uh, in, a, in a journal, uh, in a peer reviewed journal. The links are at the bottom right. So for those of you who have experienced toxicity with chemotherapy and radiation, uh, let us uh, see how that happens. Here we have a normal tissue, and then there is uh, a toxin that comes in, which is the chemotherapy or the radiation that causes DNA damage. And uh, the DNA has some interesting uh, inherent mechanisms to try to repair itself. And one of the ones that you mostly have heard about is called methylation, right? So, so the DNA inhibits the expression of certain genes naturally. And that might stop a tumor uh, causing gene from turning on. And that's why DNA methylation is so important because if that DNA can methylate at a CH3, uh, a methyl group, then we can prevent this damage that is happening with the toxin. And so, for example, breast cancer, heart disease, highly associated with um, demethylation uh, effects. And we, could, and we could improve this by changing lifestyle, by changing the diet and exercise detoxification. So DNA methylation slows down as we age. And so as we age, since DNA methylation slows down, genes can become active and cause disease, which when you were younger, that's why typically cancer is a disease of older individuals. Unfortunately, now, days, we're seeing young uh, patients with colon cancer, 23-year-old, 24-year-old with colon cancer. I never saw that 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so this is because the toxic exposure is so overwhelming that the DNA damage is happening. The DNA cannot methylate sufficiently to turn off these uh, cancer or tumor causing genes, right, from turning on. So a few ways just so that you know that you could increase methylation and talk to your doctor about this, but it's folate, folate, uh, B12, B6. Uh, there's a product called choline, uh, which is basically uh, made by the liver, but uh, we need to, in very small amounts, we need to get the choline from exogenous sources from our food. Uh, but very important for brain and liver health. Uh, and so 
Proline, we typically recommend about 500 milligrams per day. Uh, and it's, it's found in, uh, in uh, fish and eggs, uh, those type of foods. And then methionine is another uh, good product to improve uh, methylation pathways. And genistein, which is in soy. The only problem is be careful with soy because most of it is GMO, genetically modified. Uh, unless you could get a genistein product that's pure and whole. And uh, one other uh, compound that becomes very important in methylation is polyphenols. And you could get polyphenols um, extensively in berries. You could get it, this is my favorite, dark chocolate, right? <laughs> I guess that's my reason for having dark chocolate is because of the polyphenols. Berries, beans, nuts, and vegetables. So as you see, we can do a lot to decrease uh, the risk of uh, DNA damage and damage from radiation and chemotherapy inducing cancer stem cell formation. So it boggles my mind when I hear that an oncologist, a conventional oncologist doesn't inform and educate their patients on this pathways and things that you can do if you're going undergoing chemo and radiation to protect yourself from inducing cancer stem cell formation. So when we have this toxin in the form of chemotherapy and or radiation, it causes DNA damage. This is a cumulative, so this doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and those patients that have a lot of PET scans, a lot of CAT scans, this radiation also is a toxin. It's a cumulative and we're causing self-renewal of cancer stem cells. And when that happens, we're going more in the direction of tumor formation. So really chemotherapy and radiation are, it's a double-edged sword because it is shrinking the tumor because it's killing the non-cancer stem cells that make up 99% of the tumor, but it's promoting further cancer stem cell resistant and damaging DNA through basically uh, methylation pathways. So these cancer stem cells, if, um, if, if we're healthy and we're doing all these things, we can you know, prevent this process from happening. And that's called the differentiation, also can lead to induced cancer stem cells and can lead to cancer stem cells. So external factors that can reverse uh, this uh, differentiation, normal cells to become normal cells, we have to avoid. And those are the, the toxins that we're talking about. So you see how radiation and chemotherapy affect the non-cancer stem cells, and they lead to more induced cancer stem cells that ultimately become circulating tumor cells, as you saw in the previous slide. And then that leads to metastasis and further tumor genesis. I know this is a, a, a little bit of complex information, but it's important for you to visualize this and to know, especially if you know someone, a friend, a loved one, or yourself, you're undergoing radiation and chemotherapy, please see a nutritionist or a functional medicine doctor that understands this so that they can help you in uh, your methylation pathways, your detoxification that you'll learn a lot about in part two. And of course, that's what I said, you have tumor resistant uh, uh, cells, right? So uh, treatment resistant cells. So as this process happens and more and more radiation and chemotherapy, then those cancer cells become resistant to treatment. And this is why they have to change the chemo. Let's try this chemo, or let's now add this other program, or let's go into this clinical trial. That's when they really don't, you know, these these cells are really treatment resistant. So other chemotherapy induced toxicity, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So uh, I hope you could see this slide. We don't have to you know, go through it all, but on the left side, it says agents. And on the, um, I'm sorry, on the right side, it says agents. On the left side, it says 
organ system and toxicity. So the agents are the chemotherapies, right? And then on the left side is what cells or what symptoms or pathologies happen. One of the main chemotherapies that's used, let's pick one, 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, sort of in the white there causes enteritis. That means inflammation of the gut, the enteric system, the gut lining, right? So if the gut is affected, then what happens? The immune system is affected. Because 75% 75 of our immune system is our, in our gut, an area called Peyer's patches in the small intestine. So if you're taking 5-FU or if the doctor's recommending 5-FU, then make sure you're taking prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics, making sure you're replenishing that flora that's being affected by the 5-FU in this case. And so the list goes on and on as to, you know, the toxicities related uh, to chemotherapy and um, in this case. And here, uh, Plastitoxel, it's another uh, uh, well-known chemotherapy and in induces pulmonary toxicity. This is a breast cancer uh, patient and it's hard to see if you're not a radiologist, but it has like this faint uh, ground glass, like little ground glass that's spread throughout both lung fields, right? And so this patient, not only because of the CT image, but because of their symptoms, had to stop the chemotherapy. And that happens quite often, right? And here we see another drug inducing pulmonary toxicity in a lung cancer patient. So what you see here is that the ground glass becomes more thickened, right? And this is four weeks after the patient started with this drug. And unfortunately, it was irreversible and this patient did not survive. And here we're seeing gemcitabine, which is another very common chemotherapy used especially for uh, GI type cancers, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, stomach, esophagus. Uh, this is vasculitis, uh, inflammation of the blood vessel wall before and after therapy. You know, some very serious uh, 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 potential uh, side effects. And this is all published in the journal Radiology. So definitely uh, toxicities induce. And here you see from the left, the baseline to the right, two months later, after this patient had chem started chemotherapy, it's what's called pseudocirrhosis. Cirrhosis means like the organ, in this case, the liver is becoming smaller. So if you see my cursor on the left image where it says baseline, this is all the liver right here. All this is the liver, all this is liver tissue. And you see on the right image, it's like the liver has shrunk, shrunken, is that a word? Has decreased in size, right? So it's cirrhosis induced by the chemotherapy. And so they call it pseudocirrhosis because it's not like happening because of hepatitis C or uh, any other viral infection. So. Uh, significant side effects that can happen with these toxicities of chemotherapy. So the point here is not to tell you we never give chemo or don't ever get chemo. That's a decision you know you have to make as an individual. But the point is that you understand visually now. I know you know that chemotherapy is toxic, but now you know more visually and you see what can happen, right? And so. Uh, think twice about doing chemotherapy without uh, supportive therapies of detoxification. And so there was a doctor in Hungary by the name of Dr. Hans Selye, and he uh, developed what's called the Selye's General Adaptation Syndrome. And that means that the first thing to, that happens when a toxin uh, comes into us is we alarm, right? So the person starts to smoke, and the first thing is the cough. The body is alarming, you know, this toxin is not good for me. And then the person continues to smoke and the body goes into that middle phase, which I like to call adaptation phase. 
So the body adopts, the cough goes away, and the person continues to smoke. Years later, he or she develops uh, COPD, emphysema, or lung cancer. Why? Because now the body has shifted into that last phase, which is on the right call exhaustion phase. And now the body is not able to resist that stressor, those toxins in the smoke, and the body cannot repair and regenerate. And so you see how it's a, it's a, it's a process. Cancer doesn't happen overnight. If you're exposed to toxins today and you say, oh, it's just a little bit, you know, I have some friends who use those uh, earbuds and that's giving them radiation into their brain every second that they have it on, but they don't feel anything. They're young. They said, oh, that's okay. But see, this is a cumulative as you heard before. Uh, so we need to distance ourselves from potential uh, toxin exposures as much as we can. And these are the exotoxins, and then work on the exo endotoxins that we uh, will speak about in a moment. So, how do we unblock and and open these detox pathways? Right. It's easy to understand that we God has given us various detoxification pathways. Why? <laughs> he knew that this world was going to be toxin. He knows that we're going to eat junk food and, you know, we don't, we're going to be exposed to so much. So the colon detoxifies, the pancreas detoxifies. These are organs of detoxification. The liver is the biggest one, liver and gallbladder, the blood. The best way to detox the blood is by juicing for example. Sinuses, why do we have these hollow uh, cavities in the front of our face, right? So we could detoxify mucus and any buildup there. The lungs, the skin, the biggest organ of detoxification, the skin. The lymph nodes, we have thousands of lymph nodes. And what are they? They're filters to sequester toxins and, and pathogens in cancer cells and uh, eliminate them. And of course, the urinary system, right? How we uh, excrete uh, through our urine, feces, sweat, through our breath, and never forget detoxing our thoughts. So when these detox pathways are the, dysfunctional, this causes an upstream buildup of toxins that ultimately lead to disease. But first, it's the disease at the cell level. And that's when we don't know. But as the months, the years pass, then it manifests itself because now the body goes into an exhausting phase from cellular alarm, adaptation, exhaustion. Multiple systems combine to create an integrative detoxification network. That's brilliant, right? The Lord has given us multiple ways that come together, work synergistically and in an integrative fashion to form a network of detoxification pathways. One is the immune system. Two is the liver. Three is what's called the HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, renal, or adrenal, super renal system. Number four is neural reflex system that has to do with the autonomic and uh, nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Number five is physical barriers that we have, like the mucous membrane, the skin, right? Uh, even our fingernails, our hair. And number six is detoxification, inherent detoxification at the cell level. The cells are brilliant in health they're brilliant in detoxing and absorbing nutrients and absorbing water, right? Also very important. And in maintaining a good electrical magnetic gradient, that charge of the inside and the outside of the cell is very important to allow that cell to be able to detoxify. That's why treatments like pulsating electromagnetic field therapy, PMF, is so important at that level. Uh, things like 
like uh, oxygenation, right? Hyperbaric oxygen ozone that have multiple benefits, but one of them is to oxygenate that cell so that it can function healthier and detox appropriately. So let's go through something that might seem a little um, complex, but we'll simplify it is we know that the liver is the workhorse of our systemic detoxification. It's like almost everything goes to the liver. That's why we have to pamper our liver. We have to love our liver. We have to detox our liver in health and more importantly in disease. And we talked about the toxins, right? Uh, endotoxin, exotoxins, as you see there on, on the left. And uh, most of the toxins are fat soluble. That means that they um, they work well and they can they can um, uh, they can impregnate and be absorbed by by the liver. So we have two phases of detoxification in the liver. Why not one phase? God gave us two phases because this is a key detox, detoxification organ. So the first phase of detoxification is called the P450 enzyme mediated reaction. And that's things like, uh, you know, these words might not mean too much for you, but there's all these ways that the liver uses this pathway called the cytochrome P450 uh, to, uh, to push this detoxification in the right direction. And here, the important thing to know is that, again, nutrient health is key. We have to have sufficient levels of vitamin B12, B3, B6, folic acid, glutathione, that is the most important antioxidant, the most powerful antioxidant in the body is called glut glutathione. And it's produced by the liver also. And guess what? And we'll talk about this in part two, but when you do a coffee enema, you're significantly increasing your glutathione uh, production. And so very important for phase one detoxification. Brand chain amino acids, very important, flavonoids and phospholipids. So this will enable our phase one detoxification pathway to be healthy. And as this is happening, there's intermediate residue or metabolites, of course, that are secreted. And now we talk about phase two detoxification, and now we're getting into methylation, where I talked about before, uh, using amino acids, using glutathione. And this is where these toxins really are bound, they're conjugated reaction pathways. Now we're you know, binding these, these toxins so that the liver can excrete them and ultimately leave the body. And here, uh, some of the key nutrients are the amino acids, glycine, taurine, glutamine, and this one that now has become a bit controversial because, uh, you know, some people don't want us to have it, but an N-acetylcysteine, NAC, N-A-C, very important uh, nutrients. I take about 1,000 milligrams of NAC a day just for prevention, N-acetylcysteine, the other one is cysteine and methionine. Uh, but remember, we could get a lot of these nutrients from where? From our diet. If we're eating a wholesome nutrition, plant-based program, if that's your diet type, right? We call it the metabolic type. Some, some people do well with beef and chicken right? Depends on their autonomic nervous system. Others require more of a plant-based, 70% raw and 30% cook. And so regardless of what category you're in, and maybe this could be a topic of another uh, webinar, uh, then, then you, you're going to get your nutrients from food. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Before you reach out to a bottle of supplements, make sure that you're eating wholesome and healthy. So there we are, we have phase two detoxification and we are making those fat soluble uh, compounds. We're making them water soluble and now ready for elimination. 
So as we proceed and, and finish this, uh, this idea with the liver, uh, we saw that we have uh, phase one, phase two detoxification, and now the body is able to eliminate this toxin via what? The excretory systems uh, that in one way will release the bile through the colon and the feces and the stool. That's what gives the stool the color the brownish color is this bile that is being uh, mm -hmm. removed from the body, eliminated through phase two detoxification pathway. And then the other one is through the bloodstream and the lymphatics going into the kidneys and out the body through the urine. So see why it's important to make sure we're having good bowel movements, one a day, at least two a day, preferably, urination that we're drinking five to eight glasses of uh, eight ounce glasses of water a day and that we're getting really hydrated and uh, our urine output is ideal because these are the two ways that we're detoxing um, these products from um, from the liver so uh, this is an interesting slide because it goes over many other things. But for now, that's the important thing to do. It's important also, of course, where it says toxin overload, the less toxins we have, the less oxidative stress. We don't want to overwhelm the cells, the tissues, and ultimately produce organ damage to the liver. That's what happens when there's too much alcohol consumption. That's what happens when there's viruses that infect the liver. That's what happens when there's tumors that metastasize to the liver or start in the liver, like hepatocellular carcinoma. So people that have a burden on the liver, they're producing more reactive oxygen species or free radicals, they're rusting, and that's hampering these detoxification pathways, in this case, uh, phase one, and then you have a compromised liver. So what do we need to do? First is nutrition, then is supplementation, and thirdly is detoxification, uh, all important. And coffee enemas, again, is one of the best ways to detox the liver. And then key antioxidants for uh, liver health and to decrease uh, oxidative stress in the liver. Uh, we know vitamin A, uh, vitamin C, of course, vitamin E, and then the micronutrients, selenium, copper, zinc, and magnesium, manganese, very important. CoQ10, bioflavonoid, silymarin, or milk thistle, very important nutrient for the liver, silymarin or milk thistle and uh, the water-soluble vitamins like vitamin C, and then the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A and E. Selenium, zinc, you know that that's very important uh, for cell health and the immune system in addition to the benefits in the liver. So here it says, because toxins are fat-soluble, they also concentrate and get stored in fat cells in the liver and other parts of the body, sickening this matrix, that terrain. You know, one of the things we're seeing and we have seen for years at our centers is patients come in, they have no overt signs of liver toxicity. You know, they don't have discomfort. The doctors back home said, oh, you know, your liver enzymes are well. But when our radiologist does the uh, ultrasound and scans the liver, he sees what's called fatty liver. And that could be grade one, two, or three, or even four. And so we are seeing that these toxins are accumulating in the liver, these fat-soluble substances, and creating the storage of fat cells in the liver ca causing fatty liver. What's interesting is that after the patients are at the center for three weeks and then go home for the three months, and when they come back, oftentimes, we see either that the fatty liver has disappeared and it's clear, or that you know from grade three fatty liver, now the patient is at grade one fatty liver. So the beauty about the liver is that it's a tremendous organ of regeneration. It can, you know, we could have like a third of the liver, if not less, and the liver will grow, grow back. So it's a very noble uh, organ, but uh, you know, it, 
it will take a toll if we're not careful. So, so let's love and pamper our liver in every and any way that we can. I hope you are posting some questions that might be interesting uh, to answer towards the end. And um, this is important. Uh, this is uh, what I mentioned, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal uh, uh, system, where uh, what happens in the brain sets off a cascade of hormones that ultimately increases cortisol. Remember, cortisol is the stress hormone, right? So I have been uh, quoted as saying that um, a negative thought can kill you faster than a bad germ. So what's important here to know is that what's happening in the brain is causing downstream and upstream and every stream is causing modifications to our system, our biological terrain, that matrix, and increasing uh, inflammation is decreasing the ability of the body to detoxify is causing endocrine stress and metabolic stress because we're with these negative thoughts and these traumas and stresses and emotions, we're influencing in a negative way detoxification because we have this stress hormone uh, called cortisol that is uh, manufactured or produced in a high, high amount. So a negative thought can kill you faster than a bad germ. Remember that always, always, always. Because oftentimes we negate or neglect this important uh, network that can and does influence detoxification, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal cortex system. And um, I mentioned the neural reflex uh, system. This is a sympathetic. The sympathetic is like the fight or flight. You know, the lion is chasing you, our sympathetic system kicks in and we evade the, the charging lion. We need the sympathetic nervous system uh, to do what it does for us to survive. The parasympathetic nervous system, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying all this, but that's the, the main gist of this. The parasympathetic system is that system that allows us to, to chill, right? It's what stimulates uh, uh, the digestion, right? So that we can digest so that we can go back to functioning and running and thinking better. Why do we get sleepy sometimes when we eat? Because there's the focus of our autonomic nervous system, our neural reflex system, is on digestion, not on you know brain activity and so forth. So these systems must be in balance, sympathetic, parasympathetic balance. When we have imbalance and one of these systems is dominant, what's happening? We're becoming more acidic or more alkalosis, more basic or more acidic. And we are in a imbalance metabolically and functioning because one of these systems is dominating the other. And through nutrition, through diet, through detoxification pathways and routines, we can balance these uh, autonomic uh, nervous system pathways. Very, very important because most cancer patients are in sympathetic overdrive. I would say 90% of patients, and, and, and by the way, 90% of cancer, especially all the solid tumors, are parasympathetic in nature, or I'm sorry, sympathetic in nature, where the remaining about 10% are parasympathetic, like the leukemias, the lymphomas, the melanomas, the multiple myelomas and the sarcomas, those are more parasympathetic dominant type uh, cancers or, and individuals, whereas the sympathetic is the fight or flight and that's the majority of, of the cancers. And someone could be in sort of in the middle and balance and still have either or of the two cancer types, right? But typically it's one is dominating the other. So the next uh, part of this is how to detox at the cell level. 
Remember, cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make systems like the digestive system is composed of the esophagus, the stomach, the pancreas, the small intestine. So the system is composed of the organs. And ultimately, of course, the systems make our body. So everything though starts at the cell level. So how do cells, the basic unit of life, how do they respond to a toxin? So here's the cell and uh, the cell suffers uh, from a biological or chemical toxin. You understand then then the cell has a couple options. One option is to die and you have a dead cell, right? That's called apoptosis. The second possibility is for the cell to repair itself and detox, and then we have a healthy cell. The third possibility is that there's DNA damage like we talked about before. There's methylation problems, there's too much toxicity, and we alter that cell and ultimately that can lead to cancer. So the cell can kill itself or apoptose, it can repair itself and become healthy, or it can survive and ultimately become cancer. So a cancer cell is really a cell that couldn't repair itself, couldn't kill itself, went rogue, and now it's trying to survive. As most organisms do, they try to survive. That's the nature of life, right? So see how important it is to get rid of toxins and to decrease and stop the toxic load in our body from external environment and internal, exogenous, endogenous, because we definitely don't want that cell to ultimately go into the malignant uh, pathway here. So this is a series of slides and I'll be very brief on this, but uh, how do our cells respond to toxins, right? Um, because we're always going to be uh, exposed to toxins internal, external sources of uh, reactive oxygen species that can be caused by chemotherapy, by radiation, by electromagnetic fields, and all the toxins that you can think of. And these are key, these stresses on the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the energy pack of the cell. So these stressors are key to the formation of cancer, the progression of cancer, and the metastasis of cancer. And so all this is uh, telling us that the toxins, especially when they get inside the cell, they become uh, quite of an issue. And we have different things happening at the cell level, right? Um, at the mitochondria. And anything that's happening at, inside of the cell, you know, it's of concern. And so we want, as we said before, uh, apoptosis, the cells to die, or, um, or consume their cell, uh, you know, that's called autophagy. That's what fasting can do. Fasting can increase autophagy uh, because you're uh, producing more uh, stem cells, healthy stem cells. So the cells die, we have the elimination of abnormal cells before they even have a chance to become malignant. That's what we want, the blue, right? The blue and uh, on the top, left going up to our health. On the bottom, you see the red is because there's an overwhelm to the system, there's drug resistance, there's DNA damage, tumor progress, the cell survives, and now we have chaos happening. Progression of tumor, transformation of cancer cells from one type to another, these cells becoming you know, really resistant uh, even to chemo and radiation. So this is another very good slide uh, for you to see how toxins, when they get into the cell, it's uh, very important to detox always, 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 to live a life of detoxification. So our extracellular matrix that you see here, the uh, ground regulating system behaves uh, like a filter. It's a biological physical filter that sequesters or entraps toxins and prevents them from entering into the cell. This is why detoxing of this matrix is so important so it could do its function. It's a 
it's like a lattice formation, as you see here, the toxins in red, and we need to get to these toxins and eliminate them through the pathways that you heard before, the skin, the sweat, the feces, and the urine before they get into the cell. Our body goes through daily rhythms of uh, acute inflammation, and that acute inflammation is happening without us even knowing. And what it's doing, it's, 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 it's making this extracellular matrix space um, healthy. It's activating lymphatic drain and circulation to eliminate, eliminate this toxin. This is why if someone is sedentary and is not moving, you know, there's more accumulation of toxin, there's more inflammation, there's obesity, there's, there's this, there's that, there's that. And ultimately, chronic disease, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, no wonder. We want this extracellular space to be flowing, moving healthy. And the only way to do that, not the only way, one of the ways is to get up and move. We have to move, 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 move to be healthy. So there you go. Once this is happening, those toxins are being released from that matrix to the lymphatic vessels and the venous uh, circulation, the, the veins, right? Uh, and leave the body through pathways that I mentioned before, the feces, the, the urine, the skin, the breath, right? Uh, very important. So very visual of what the body does and then it rebuilds that extracellular matrix, that structure to continue its role. So on a constant basis, we have acute inflammation, a little bit of inflammation happening, and then takes care of the toxins and rebuilds it. So that's why when you go to over cancer or you have blood tests and they tell you sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein, those are measures of inflammation, homocysteine and others, they're never zero because there's always some inflammation happening. So for example, sedimentation rate, set rate, uh, in Spanish is called ESR, it could be from zero, it's never, I've never seen a zero, but the lab says from zero to 20 is considered normal. I've never ever seen a zero because physiologically it cannot happen. And then the other one is C-reactive protein, very important marker of inflammation. The higher the CRP, C-reactive protein, the more, progressive a cancer can be and the more inflammation there is. Now we know what's happening. There's a lot of inflammation. All this is congested. Toxins are going into the cell and the patient is sicker and cancer is progressing. So, but even the C-reactive protein, it's never zero, even in a healthy person. It could be 0.1, but it's never zero, right? So, so inflammation is good as long as it's mitigated. And poorly functioning lymphatic system, venous system, it causes a toxic overload. It compromises that ability of the matrix to remove the toxin, causing inflammation, causing higher concentration of these toxins penetrating into the cell and ultimately causing disease at the cell level, right? Very clear that uh, we need to move if you can get a mini trampoline, just bounce, walk. It's very important because the lymphatic vessels need movement to drain, right? This is why lymphatic massages, manual lymphatic massages, walking, mini trampoline, just moving up and down, getting on your tippy toes and just bouncing up and down for three minutes a few times a day. Does wonders. You're activating your lymphatic system. And uh, Deep breaths, inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. Get this, get this um, toxins out in any way, skin brushing. And we'll talk more about that in part two. Uh, uh, but you'll see that there's practical detox routines that we could do to make sure that these systems are working as, as ideal as possible. Because as you're seeing here, what we don't want is those toxins then to penetrate the uh, cell and create an intracellular toxicity. That is why uh, inflammation, uh, chronic inflammation is unfavorable to health. 
So this is just a lot more. I'll skip the slide here, but basically this slide is telling that when there is um, uh, you know, more toxins that are causing inflammation and affecting that tumor micro, that microenvironment, I'm sorry, that, that extracellular matrix, we're causing a sluggish and unhealthy terrain that is not going to be able to detox adequately. And of course, that's supporting uh, disease. And that's ultimately what happens at later stages of disease or cancer, right? Where now there's been chronic inflammation for so long, toxic exposures, and now it becomes very difficult for the body to detox. Uh, with the best of detox routines. So that's why if any of you are doing chemotherapy or any toxic therapy, make sure that you're actively practicing detox routines on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and a monthly basis. And we'll cover that in part two. And of course, that's why detoxification is one, as I mentioned earlier, one of the seven key principles of cancer therapy. Detoxification itself is a bioregulatory treatment strategy. Detoxification is not like, oh, whenever I feel like it, you know, I'd rather now eat. Yeah, eating is important, but you have to consider that detox is a treatment strategy designed to correct abnormalities in that terrain, that matrix, and restore the body to a healthy auto-regulation, when the body can have that acute inflammation, do what it needs to do, restructure, rebuild, and, and be healthy. Simple as that. So let's quickly touch upon the problems with heavy metals. Uh, uh, here we're talking about the anthropogenic sources of heavy metals. If you don't know what that word means, it is a word not used too often, but anthropogenic means it it's, means environmental change or damage caused or produced by humans, right? So when we're destroying the planet, we're mining, we're improperly disposing waste, you know, we're doing fossil fuel combustion, industrial processes, using fertilizers and Roundup and pesticides and all this with deforestation, we are causing and or producing environmental change that is a big source of heavy metal toxicity nowadays. And here we see uh, on the left uh, chart, heavy metals like mercury, lead, chromium, cadmium, arsenic, and all the different uh, you know, effects that it has on our physiology from DNA damage to decreasing tumor suppressor genes, decreasing glutathione absorption and production, decreasing the ability of the cell to kill itself, apoptosis. So heavy metals are affecting most, if not all, of those pathways that you learned already that allow the body to be healthy and to be able to detoxify at a cell level, a tissue and an organ level like the, uh, the liver that we showed earlier. And there are some heavy metal tests. Uh, you've seen some of this. This is from doctor's data. And here, what you see is you see aluminum. The first one, that bar for aluminum is so, it's in the reddish area. Aluminum is one of the biggest toxicity now. And the problem with aluminum is it crosses into the brain ba uh, blood brain barrier. So my good friend, Dr. Dietrich Klenhar says that aluminum, mercury, uh, EMF, and glyphosate are the biggest toxicities in, 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 in the planet now. So aluminum, glyphosate, and, heavy, and um, EMF, electromagnetic fields, right? Uh, and so aluminum is big here in this patient, lead, uh, mercury were the biggest three. So it's good to consider having a heavy metal test so that you know where you stand and then do appropriate measures of detoxification of heavy metals. Remember, where there's heavy metals, there is what, and Tara will like this because she knows this very much, is when there's heavy metals, there is associated parasites. So when you heavy metal detox, you have to do a parasite cleanse also. 
Okay, here is another company uh, called Quicksilver by my friend uh, Christopher Shade. And um, here, uh, you know, he does, his lab does uh, heavy metal testing uh, in, uh, in urine, in blood, and in hair. And what was interesting about this on the left is that you see normal minerals and what the percentile of those are, and then uh, in green, and then in red, it says potentially toxic elements. We know arsenic, arsenic is in water. Well water is sometimes loaded with arsenic and uh, uranium and cadmium. This patient also has strontium. Strontium is a, is a unique uh, metal and um, it's a great threat to the human health, especially in high amounts. And it's often found in foods like grains, leafy vegetables, and dairy products that are not of good sources. And ultimately, if there is strontium uh, toxicity, it could hamper bone development, especially in children. It could lead to anemia and ultimately cancer. So strontium is a often um, not... Um, examine heavy metal, but it can, uh, in moderate to high doses of toxicity, like in this patient, it's in the 80th percentile, it can cause serious problems uh, uh, leading even to cancer. And then on the right here, we have uh, urine analysis and hair analysis of heavy metals. So uh, as we go on, and we're just about finished everyone, because I'm really anxious to get Corey, our guest patient, uh, online. So here we see uh, what another one of my friends, Dr. D Dan Pampa, uh, he talks about the five R's of true cellular detox and healing. Why is this important? Because remember the cell, the basic unit of life. So to be in health, we have to start detoxing at the cell level. And Dr. Pampa talks about the five R's in detoxing at the cell level. Number one is logical, remove. Remove sources of toxins in your life. That might mean get a mold test to see if there's mold in your home. Many, many homes have hidden mold. So please, please consider doing that. And then um, remediating uh, the mold uh, areas if they do exist in your house. Check your water sources. Do they have toxic metals or, or fluoride or chlorine or what, what's in that water? And so remove the sources of toxin, electromagnetic fields, um, EMFs, right? Uh, from cell phones, from those earbuds, from Wi-Fi at home and so forth. The next R is Regenerate, regenerate the cell membrane. I mentioned pulsating electromagnetic fields, right? PEMF. I mentioned also, well, I will mention things like grounding, right? Where we get ions going to the beach. If you live in a, in a beach community, going to water, water is so healing. Going to the woods and breathing, regenerating these cell membranes. It's so, so crucial to cellularly detoxifying. The next R is restoring cellular energy, eating healthy, being active, getting your right nutrients, like CoQ10, right, that will restore mitochondria health, uh, eat uh, the right foods for your, for your metabolic type. The next R is reducing inflammation. I don't think I have to talk too much about this one anymore. We fully understand that information has to be reduced because um, there's a friend of mine who wrote a book, uh, Inflammation Nation, and it's probably should be Inflammation Planet, right? <laughs> uh, most of everyone on the planet has higher level of inflammation than we should have. And the last R, again, reestablishing methylation because ultimately damage that cannot be repaired in the DNA is causing a demethylation problem that leads to disease and the cell uh, suppressor genes not coming into play. And then we're causing, um, uh, we're, we might be stopping, we will be stopping the tumor causing genes from, uh, from 
from keeping, staying off, right? So this is very important methylation. So we move, we generate, we store, reduce, and reestablish. Those are the five R's. All right, so with that, I want to leave you with one question for you to ponder uh, for <laughs> the next two weeks. And please, if you have someone that uh, is not with us today, have them watch the replays, but ask, maybe this is a question. It's not, it, it, it is a question that I've been asked so many times. I have lived a clean life. I always eat healthy. I detox frequently. I exercise regularly. I get enough sleep. I have fantastic healthy relationships, but I still got cancer. Why? So please think about this and we'll continue to address this in, in part two. And maybe our, our, our patient guest could uh, resonate with this question. And maybe he's asked himself this question. I don't know, we'll ask Corey and we'll see. Uh, what he says, but Corey Mueller is with us today. He's a, a, a faith-based uh, family Christian. He was in Hope for Cancer Clinic on February 2019. So that's a bit over two years. He had a double diagnosis of testicular cancer and of um, follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There he is with his beautiful family, his son and his wife. And uh, welcome, Corey. Welcome to our webinar. Hi, Dr. Tony. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And it's good to see you again. There you are. Okay. You're looking good. <laughs> so do you. So do you, my friend. Kari, before, before you share, I will never, ever, never, ever forget in my life when you were at the Cancun Center and you were with your baby boy. And that interaction that we had that day in the little theater room, it's dear to my heart. So uh, as he grows older, I think I'm going to remind him of that or, uh, you know, it was yeah, just- Dr. Something. Tony, he, he had just turned three at the time, I think it was. Um, and he still remembers playing peekaboo with you, so. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he still awesome. remembers that. And he remembers yeah. you and uh, Dr. Allen and Mari Carmen and talks about them all the time. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, kids, uh, I know when you went through this challenge, the first thing we think about is our children, right? Uh, even more than ourselves, or sometimes even more than our spouses. So um, how was your experience when you heard that uh, C word? Tell us a bit about that, Corey. Yeah, I was originally diagnosed. Um, our son had just turned two years old. Not, no, it was, he was a year old, excuse me. And I was diagnosed in 2016 uh, with pure seminoma testicular cancer, um, stage 1A. And the doctors had removed the tumor, uh, said it was successfully encapsulated and there was no need for further treatment, just active surveillance. So that initial diagnosis, it was just, I was paralyzed with fear. A newly married man with a, a young son and um, it, it was hard to hear, but you know, I, I trusted the doctors and after they said they had removed the tumor, nothing to worry about, um, just we'll follow up with scans. I thought that was the end of it. Um, well, I, I did. The, yeah, I'm sorry, Corey. One of the things I want to mention here because you 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 say a very important term that's used often in oncology is active surveillance. So the question is, what's the difference between or the similarities with active surveillance and watchful waiting? Right, we don't, want, we don't want to watchfully wait because what are you waiting for? You're waiting, you know, patients are doing CAT scans or PET scans every three, six months, and then the oncologist is waiting for something to show up to do something. Whereas exactly. active surveillance could be a little bit better in the sense that if you're actively surveilling something, you're monitoring it more closely and you should be doing something about it, you know, nutrition, <laughs> detoxification, and so forth. Uh, were you doing something during this active surveillance uh, time? No, not the not for the first um, that first two years. I didn't do anything. Um, I um, I fully entrusted the doctors. They said, you know, nothing really needed to change in our lifestyle. That they first off didn't know the cause of it. 
but said mm -hmm. it was taken care of. And I thought that meant I could just continue as is mm -hmm. and we're done with it. Um, and um, that didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't so happen. What, ha what happened? So in um, 2018, um, it was June of 2018, just through an, a, a, a subsequent scan, uh, the doctors had noticed two enlarged lymph nodes above my left kidney. Um, mm -hmm. After a biopsy, it was revealed that not only the, had the testicular cancer returned, but I also had follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which I was told by my oncology team here in Naples um, that it was treatable, but ultimately not curable. Mm -hmm. um, and the course of action was to treat the testicular cancer first with, uh, with three cycles of chemotherapy and then subsequently have a, a follow-up scan and proceed treating the follicular lymphoma. Mm -hmm. um, so I went through the regular treatments of the, the testicular cancer, had a follow-up scan at the beginning of 2019. It was January of 2019 to find out that the chemotherapy didn't work. Uh, the cancer had actually metastasized the lymph nodes in my chest and was going to my lungs. And prior to that, my wife, God bless her, she had um, started seeking out alternative treatments, just watching um, various videos, just doing a lot of research on online um, and ultimately came across the uh, Truth About Cancer series and Hope for Cancer. And while I was going through treatment, we kind of made the decision that if the treatment didn't work, just because I had quite a few setbacks and there was a few challenges with the chemo, um, that if it didn't work, that we would ultimately be going to hope for cancer. So um, I received that diagnosis at the beginning of 2019 that it had metastasized and immediately within, I think, 10 days, we were in Cancun, uh, my wife, my son, uh, my mother-in-law, my, my parents, we were down there and I was beginning treatment within, I think, a day of arriving. Mm. One of the things, Corey, that I would like to point out is something you, that you were told is that you were told that the lymphoma was not curable. That's what you said, right? That's what the doctors had told right. me. I had two teams of oncologists uh, that kind of worked together, but I, I was told that it was ultimately not curable. Yeah, and I want to emphasize that point uh, to all of our attendees and all of us that are watching now or watching the replay is that I believe that all cancers can be cured. And, and obviously you and I know that not curable would only be in the best of worlds in the physical world, not in the spiritual world. Because how many times have we seen the Lord intervene when from a medical perspective, you know, we thought, hey, you know, this, this is not looking good and it was cured. So that being said, for sure, the Lord can cure any cancer at any stage. So cancer is curable from that spiritual perspective. And even from the physical perspective, I've seen cancers cured throughout my 30 plus years. And so I want all of us to understand that don't take that to heart if you have been told that, if you're going through that journey now, uh, you know, believing that, okay, you know, I'm just trying to extend my life or this is not curable because something with someone with a white coat and a lot of diplomas on the wall said that it's not curable, right? So uh, I, I wanted to point that out. What, what did you believe, Corey, when, when you were told all this? I believed everything. I was, my mom had been in the medical, conventional medical industry for, pretty much most of my life. So mm -hmm. I thought what they were telling me was full, um, fully accurate. And I had no reason to doubt what I was being told. And, mm -hmm. and I think the biggest thing for me was I was just paralyzed with fear. So I didn't want to, you know, after treatments, um, after having a doctor's consultation, having scans, biopsies, I wanted to forget about cancer. I wanted to completely just be with my family. And when I was home, just forget about it. And then, you know, when I was either in the chemo ward or that's when I was really focused on what I was doing there. But outside of meeting with doctors or having treatments, I did not want to think about cancer. I didn't want to do any alternative research. I didn't want to really discuss it with my wife even um, on the things that she was finding uh, that, that could ultimately be beneficial, even if it was to kind of help me through the chemo process. Mm -hmm. um, I just 
yeah, it's it's like I shut down. Well, you you I, I say it in a loving way, Corey. You kind of fooled me because when I when I met you in Cancun, you know, you were gun ho, you were there for the right reasons. So was it that your wife kind of pushed you in that direction, or what happened? No, it was because of the um, when we met with the oncologist on February fourth of twenty nineteen the options that were available after the chemo or after the cancer had spread were, were very, um, it, 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 there weren't very many options um, that I was being presented with. And I didn't like what she had to say because really, the, I, I don't think that she quite understood what the next step was. And they were essentially just gonna throw darts at a door, dartboard and see which one stuck. Um, mm. So it, it it didn't sit well with me that there wasn't a plan. I mean, at least when I was going through the chemo process initially, they there was a plan and they were confident in what they were relaying to me. But on February 4th, there was no confidence whatsoever. And that's when um, I, I came to the realization that going to Cancun, I had to just be all in, especially with my son there, my son and my wife. Um, so, um, once, once I got to Cancun, it, it was just, it was completely different. The people, the, the environment, it was, it was where I needed to be. And I just felt like, yeah, that it was going to work that, you know, I love, I love that because I, I said those things to you now because patients get to our Cancun or Tijuana center in that, in that mindset, oh, I'm here because my wife or my daughter brought me here and, <laughs> You know, it's very difficult to heal uh, when you're not there in full trust and faith and knowing that you're there for a reason. And so I'm really happy to hear that. Were you a, um, a guy that was like that last question that I that I ended my talk with? Uh, were you that kind of guy or you ate unhealthy? What, what was your lifestyle before? Do you think you were a toxic guy or not? Or no, I, I honestly don't. Um, looking back, I mean, there was we uh, i i i think we ate fairly well um mm -hmm. uh we were very mindful i i tried to work out i was i was very active mm -hmm. uh, so none of those things really stood out especially when i was given that diagnosis i kept looking back at how could this happen especially mm -hmm. with the lifestyle that we lead right. and um and that didn't sit well either that there, you couldn't pinpoint right. yes. what the what the ultimate cause was of, mm -hmm. of um, of that cancer diagnosis. So that, yeah. Um, but now looking, you know, just, you know, talking about the detoxification today, we've, we've looked at our environment um, really subsequent to uh, the chemotherapy and, and arriving at Hope for Cancer. And there's so many things that we were doing, whether it be the lotions or the shampoos that we were using. And it's like, we completely went through our entire house and looked at every product that we were using and started there and it, it just kind of trickled over into our entire lifestyle, whether it be the, you know, the pots and pans that we were using or the, so, um, so yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's amazing once you start looking and you, you ultimately look at those products and what you're using, how scary it is. And um, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. I didn't mention that, uh, but you made some good points there because we can overlook those little details that ultimately add up, right? And become a big deal, not a little detail. So I know there's a lot of questions coming in, uh, Corey, but let me ask you, uh, without going through the whole you know, process of being at the clinic and in Cancun, how are you now? What, what, where are you now in your health? Yeah, so I have been in remission a little over two years now. Um, when I... So when I left Cancun, let's back up a second. When I left Cancun, um, I did my three weeks of treatments in Cancun, came back, and I did roughly two and a half months of at-home protocols mm -hmm. as directed by you and Dr. Allen and the rest of the medical staff at Hope for Cancer. Um, I did roughly two and a half months of at-home protocols, had a follow-up scan here in Naples, and the doctor had called, um, I'll never forget it, I broke down in tears, and so did my wife when we received that call that there was no evidence of cancer um, on that scan. And um, the subsequent scans to that have all been clear. Um, my lab work has all been clear. And um, so I've, yeah, I've, I've been in, thank the Lord, I've been in remission for a little over two years, two years and I think three months now, three months or four months. 
So. So if someone were to ask you, Corey, what was it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you weren't getting good three weeks, and then at home for three months, and then you did the scans? Yeah, yeah. Oh. What, what was it? I think it was a combination of everything. I think just the, um, you know, there was a few treatments that really stood out to me that, that I thought were very beneficial. Um, the detoxing, the, you know, looking at the food that we we're eating, it was, it was everything. It was everything. The lifestyle that we changed immediately, um, whether it be what we were eating, what we were, you know, the, the products that we were consuming, um, the sono photodynamic therapy. I think that was a big part of my treatment as well that I felt was really beneficial. Um, so the, yeah, it, it's hard to, to pinpoint just one thing. I think it's just a combination of everything that we were doing that, um, that ultimately led to where we are today. Well, you, you answered that question brilliantly because that's it. I don't have a one thing either, right? That I could say, hey, it was that. It's a combination of everything, right? And yeah. the home environment, the, the unity in your family, I also know, and I don't want to get too deep into that, but I know that you, you, know, you had a, a big uh, trauma happen in this time and uh, yeah. you, um, you faithfully and lovingly and trusting the Lord, you know, got through that and knowing that uh, there's a plan. So even as you've been in remission, there's been challenges, right? That have yeah. Big yeah. challenges that have come in your life and you have to hold steady and hold the course. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think um, I, um, you know, I, I spoke to Ryan and some of your, your team members just about that. Um, and for those that don't know, uh, my wife and I, we lost our, our son, our second son, 11 months. Um, that would have been November of this last year at, at two months old. He was born with a, a heart defect. So that, um, you know, as far as that kind of through the, the loss itself was hard and we're, you know, we're grieving and I, I don't think that'll ever stop. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we are very faithful and we know that we will see our son again. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as, as far as the treatments as well, I wanted to touch base on that. It, at that during that, that time, I did back on, up on the treatments a bit. And that was, that was worrisome to me. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to ramp up again and I have the last few months. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it, it, it was just a challenging time. So the treatments, we backed off on that. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back to Mm -hmm. all of those treatments so yeah and thank you for sharing that Corey because I know how difficult that is and I mean I don't know I could only imagine right how difficult that is and I think you're sharing this uh, once again publicly I don't know if you've had before but once you know publicly it's it's part of that grieving and that healing and thank you for for that uh, absolutely you know we always have questions right that uh we never thought you were going to be able to even have a baby, right? Yeah, yeah. We were told that it was um, that it was very unlikely that we would ever have a, a second child just going through the chemo process. So it was definitely a, a blessing and a miracle, baby. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hey, Amen, brother. So, um, any any anything else you want to talk about uh, before we open it up for questions? And questions could be for Corey, or they can be for myself. So, I want to just give you this opportunity, uh, Corey. Anything that's in your heart or your mind to to share at this time? No, I you know I, I just going back on the fear thing, like for in, for any of the patients that are newly diagnosed with cancer, I I think that's just you know, it's, it's, it's normal to, to have that fear, but um, I, I don't know if there's any words of encouragement that I can offer to, um, to, to just be open-minded to treatments like going to Hope for Cancer and, and um, just, it, it, it paralyzes you, that fear paralyzes you. And I think that was the hardest part for me and my family is just um, getting that diagnosis and shutting down. Um, but I, I would just encourage you that if you're working with an oncologist, not only to get second opinions, but look outside of the, the conventional oncology industry um, so that 
that's something that I would, would strongly recommend um, to anybody. And, and I, I have a lot of these conversations with, you know, family friends that have knows a friend that had been diagnosed. So it seems like I have these conversations at least on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing that they're just so paralyzed with fear that they think that whatever their oncologist tells them that's full, fully accurate. And um, it, it's, it's, uh, I just want to leave you with that. Anybody that has that recent diagnosis, mm -hmm. there are other options. Yeah, thank you, Corey. You know, from my point of view, it's not one way or the other way. It's it's the the integrative, and um, we are medical doctors at Hope for Cancer, and we have a yeah. lot of experience with this. So uh, we sometimes tell patients, you know, to do some chemo or to do not often, but you know, uh, surgeries and sometimes radiation is necessary to control pain or certain other situations. So. It's, it's definitely uh, important to get second opinions and always, always, as we saw today, detoxification is a must. Mm -hmm. The other six principles are a must because um, we're dealing with the characteristics of cancer, not just the tumor itself. Uh, before we go to questions, I just wanna say that cancer is not a thing that you just you know, cut out or radiate or chemo, it's a process. And unless you work on that process, you know, there's going to be more potential challenges and struggles in the future. So, so thank you, Corey. And uh, we'll switch it over to Tara and let's see what, uh, what questions we could answer. All right, sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Corey. Thank you, Dr. Tony. I will let you give your closing comments and we will finish up. Well, I never have a closing comment, Tara, but, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll give uh, Corey the, the mic and uh, give us, please, Corey, your final words of wisdom. And um, if it has to do with detoxification or toxicity, okay. If not, whatever you want to share. No. Well, well thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate um, you having me on today. It was, it was wonderful seeing you and Tara and, and speaking with you all. Um, one, one treatment that I did forget to mention, I was doing the ozone as well with the detoxification process. So when I came back from Cancun, um, I was doing the, um, the coffee enemas and then I was doing the ozone five, five days a week. And mm -hmm. I did that for the first three months. And then, um, Dr. Allen had recommended that I take a little break and then resume, which I did for another three months. So that, that's another treatment that I'm going to start up as, as well. And that provided um, a lot of benefit as well, I feel. Um, and um, um, so looking forward to starting that as well. But thank you again for having me. And it, it's great to see you. I look forward to seeing you in person here in, a, what, 10 days, 12 days. Um, right. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Corey, for um, being available for all of us and I'm sure the attendees value, you know, your words because uh, that fear is, that fear and trusting, you know, I think the first thing that we have to realize that we have to trust in the Lord and go in our spirit and, and make, uh, make decisions, right? Based out of faith and not out of fear. Uh, right. give, you, give your son a big hug for me. Tell him peekaboo and uh, <laughs> hello to your wife and we'll see you soon, Corey. <laughs> we'll see you soon, Corey. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Tara. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, attendees. And um, uh, one word, what would I say? Healing from cancer and for anything is 100% physical, 100% emotional, and 100% spiritual. <laughs> And so we have to focus on all of that 100%. So thank you, Tara. Thank you. That is so good. So true. And thank you so much, Corey. You've done such a great job. And we certainly appreciate your openness and, and sharing with us today. Uh, TaraKeys.com is an online health store that provides special care to Hope for Cancer patients. All products and equipment have been approved or chosen by Dr. Tony. You can find TaraKeys at TaraKeys.com or give them a call if you have any questions at 864-625-2121.
So we want to remind you about eight days. Hope for Cancer is featured in this TV docu-series. Eight days shares the journey of five brave cancer patients using natural and integrative therapies. You can watch all 10 episodes at hopeforcancer.com or at the Hope for Cancer Facebook page. So um, thank you for all your questions today. We are sorry if we didn't get to you. Uh, please read, reach out to our amazing admissions team at 1-619-669-6511. Our admissions counselors can answer further questions about Hope for Cancer's treatment programs. As a part of the admissions process, you can also schedule an appointment with our admissions doctor to provide answers to your medical questions about any of our treatments. Um, keep a lookout for your follow-up email today with information about these upcoming Dr. Tony Weeks, how to get additional information about both treatment centers. There is also a link included to schedule a free treatment consultation. A reminder that Hope for Cancer 7 Key Principles is live on Kindle and that the hardcover books are currently sold out and the revised first edition is coming soon. And of course, we're still cel celebrating number 11 on the Amazon bestseller list. Um, we really look forward to seeing you all here again live in two weeks on October 15th. We love you all. We are praying for you. And no matter your situation, stay hopeful.